Hi everyone, welcome to the GDC Twitch channel. My name is Brian Francis. I'm the contributing editor at I'm a contributing editor at Gamasutra.com. I am a uh, community manager for GC, and I'm here today playing a game called uh, Outer Outer Wild. Oh no, it's got the Outer Wild in my overlay. That's embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I am going. I am not going to be able to fix that for the stream. I'm so sorry about that. Oh, we used to it. Yeah, it happens a lot. Oh boy. <laughs> um. Anyway. Uh. Hi there, everyone. Um. I'm joined today after my embarrassing mistake. Uh. In the lower left-hand corner of the screen by two wonderful folks. Uh. From Mobius Digital. Those folks are Lone Vernau and Wesley Martin. Um. And in the also in the lower left-hand corner of the screen is Alec Waro. Uh, who is a content master for GC and also contributing editor at Gama Sutra. Alex, how you doing? Uh, pretty good. I'm sorry I didn't jump in earlier, but I wanted to follow good podcast etiquette and wait until I was introduced. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's uh, let's talk about this game. This game's real good, right? We should probably let um we should probably let them introduce themselves. I think. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, Wesley er, Wesley alone, could you please introduce yourselves for our guests? Sure. While I figure uh, out where the heck I'm going. I'm Wesley Martin, art director on Outer Wilds. And I'm Lon Verneau, uh, designer and producer on Outer Wilds. Nice. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Why don't you, um, I think, you know, most people who are watching probably know the story, but just in case, can you uh, talk a bit about where the idea for this game came from and sort of how it came to fruition? Um, sure, yeah. Uh, Outer Wilds was started uh, oof, uh, over eight years ago now. Yeah. Uh, as a student project at USC um, and uh, as a thesis uh, project at USC. <laughs> and uh, there were a couple of uh, starting sort of like goals with it. Mm. Uh, one of them was to create uh, a world that uh, changes over time uh, drastically, uh, like environments that like, yeah, you, as you explore them, they change in uh, in, ma in great ways like Pearl Hollow, for example, which is a planet that falls apart uh, over the course of the game loop uh, as it's being bombarded by uh, its volcanic moon. Uh, and then the other goal was to create a game about exploration and like the real, f the, the actual feeling of real space exploration. Uh, so, you know, not going out there and shooting aliens and trading, uh, but the feeling of trying to understand what's out there, trying to understand uh, the, the laws of sort of nature and how it all works uh, mm. in a way where uh, we're powerless to these massive galactic uh, forces, right? Uh, right. Oops, I think you're falling down into a black hole. I uh, am. I'm working on it. No good, pressure, Brian. Good moment to highlight the powerlessness of the player. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, uh, uh, that was sort of like how the sort of our goals starting the game. And uh, hopefully uh, we achieved some of these. There's also sort of a, a third, like, smaller goal of creating a space exploration game that feels more like real space exploration, um, where, you know, with NASA, you're going out there to discover things just because you're curious and not right. for gain. And so that was like a huge part of designing the story and the mechanics of the game. Yeah, and I think uh, in this final project, it really comes through, but you know, the, the, the development process of the thing is kind of winding, right? I mean, for people who don't know, um, you know, the original, uh, an original ver earlier version was submitted through the Independent Games Festival and it won an award there. And then, you know, there was like a, a long development process through uh, Mobius Digital to get here. Um, I, if you want to talk about that, I'd be curious to know more what that was like. But also, I'm really curious to know, like, what's it like now that it's shipped and released and you've had it out for a few months? Like, how's it going for you guys? Like, did it, you know, like, how has it been? Um... I guess should we do it chrono chronologically? Yeah, I, I can I can briefly go over like the history of the project. So, you know, it started as the student project was 2013. Yeah. Um, and um, Alex and Loan kept working on it for a couple of years, 
and then IGF was 2015, uh, and right after that, in summer of 2015, is when uh, they decided to bring it to Mobius Digital, uh, which is where they both worked at the time, and uh, that's when I got hired on, was like, okay, we're turning this into a fully-fledged project, and so we hired up an art team and kind of got going. Um, we were did a crowdfunding thing, and that did not give us enough money to last for more than like a year, mm -hmm. and so Towards the end of that year, we uh, struck up a deal with Annapurna, uh, and they've been wonderful to us ever since. Um, but basically, in the course of uh, working with them, we were like, you know, we want to make like the true version of this game. Um, and so we scrapped a lot of our work at the time and kind of started fresh with the art direction and really aimed for like making it a, a fully realized experience. And so that's what we've been working on for the last four years. Mm. And um you know, as as you move towards ship, and then I shipped it last year on Xbox, and uh, you know, I think on PC and other platforms as well. Uh, how did that go for you? I I always meant to ask. Like, was it? Uh, how was the launch? How was the the run up to launch? Like, was it what you expected? Was it harder? You know, how did it? How did it go? Um, first of all, I'll give you a piece of advice. If you if you press the jetpack up, uh, there's a prompt telling you how to use the the booster oh. that will help nice. you significantly <laughs> in traveling around um, there we go yeah that does help yeah i'm just trying to figure out i was trying to get somewhere and now i'm just trying to figure out to get there anyway continue please focus on the question my terrible gameplay yes. will resolve itself <laughs> Sorry. Hmm. um yeah i mean the it was it was definitely a bit of a uh, challenge to bring it to more platforms uh and uh we're we're definitely still uh working on that uh uh, right now, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it was it was a lot of work from both the art team and the tech team, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're we're still working on that side of things. Um, yeah, there's there's because Outer Wilds is such an experimental game, uh, it was never really intended to be brought to this level of polish. So yeah. when we made that decision, like, yeah, we're going to polish this game and make it like fully presentable and fully realized, there were a lot of things that just weren't in the game, like streaming assets or, you know, just like basic functionality that you would expect because we hadn't needed it up until that point. Mm. And so there was sort of a lot of backloaded work where it's like, okay, we need to go in and like fix all the bones underneath everything in order for all of it to layer on top correctly. Mm. And like a, a pretty big process for the art team and the tech team to go and optimize everything properly and get it into tip-top shape. And yeah. I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, and we faced so many issues that most games don't face just because uh, of the nature of the game being a full-fledged like physics simulation where whether you're there or not, things still happen, right? Like mm. uh, the destruction of Brutal Hollow uh, that you can observe in real time if you're on the planet still happens if you're not there. Right. Like, if you leave your ship somewhere, uh, like what you know, it might get tossed up by a tornado or uh, destroyed by a meteor. Like everything is always simulated, and as a result, uh, like uh, plus everything is made built on spheres, which meant uh, creating new tools for that. Um, it was a lot of challenges that uh, sort of like increased in complexity as. Uh, as we increased the quality of the visuals and uh, the amount of content. Yeah, I can only imagine. Um, real quick, we should have said at the top of the stream, and as folks filter in and out, uh, we will absolutely take your questions from chat. If you have any questions regarding game design or the specific game in general, please put them in chat, and we will harvest the good ones and relay them. Most of uh, good, too. Yeah, because this game is good. Also, and I, and I bring that up because this game is sort of you. Is unique uh, and maybe not unique but like it's very rare in the fact that most of the game's discoveries are sort of tied to play so um, you know it's not that I think we're gonna get in any kind of spoiler territory here but like the meat of playing this game is the discovery of how everything works at least in my experience so you know when we talk about things like brittle hollow being destroyed uh, you know that's because the whole place gets blown up in 22 minutes also um, so we should actually let's talk about that real quick no let's let's talk let's stay on this because I want to talk about the um, art direction and how you sort of came in, especially U.S. Like, um, you know, one of the most remarkable things about this game, in my experience, is the way it models real 
uh, scientific principles like physics and gravity and that kind of thing. Um, and also like a uh, phenomena like black holes and white holes. And uh, I'm just curious, like as you were, you know, revamping this game's look and coming at it with a bunch of new uh, tech and art, you know, what, if anything, did you take from real science to try and figure out how to make these look realistic and striking in the way that they are? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's, it's a lot of complicated things interacting, uh, but I'll try and sum it up as quickly mm. as possible. Um, no pressure. Early on, we made the decision that like, sort of one of the core things that makes Outer Wilds feel like Outer Wilds is that it doesn't lie to the player. Mm. Uh, and, you know, that's a relative term because all video games have to lie on some level. Um, but like, for example, we don't arbitrarily limit where you can go. There aren't like invisible barriers or things like that. It's like, if you can see it, you can go there. Um, and so that was sort of like something that I think made the alpha really special. And we didn't want to lose that. We wanted to make sure that everything in the game felt correct. Even if it's not actually correct, it needs to feel correct to the player. It needs to respond in the way you'd expect it to. You need to be able to test your hypotheses because it's a game about doing science. Mm -hmm. And so if they lie to you, then that prevents you from being able to test things and kind of ruins the whole experience. Um, so that led us to do things like, you know, we tried more complex visual styles with higher detail, but then players would either get distracted or we couldn't have accurate collisions so people couldn't climb on things and it just kind of cheapened the whole feel of everything. So a lot of the art direction for Outer Wilds was choosing where to use our detail and simplifying everything else so that it mm. focuses players on the things that they need to interact with. Right. What's an example of somewhere where you chose to really put a lot of detail? Um, the village where you're right now is actually a very good example. Um, mm. It's one of the more dense areas in the game in terms of there's a lot of characters to interact with and a lot of things to learn there. And so players would just spend hours at the beginning of the game in the village, not even realize it's a space exploration game and, you know, give up because they didn't understand what's going on. Mm. And so we had to carefully tune things like the lighting in the village so that, like, lights are near points of interest. Um, we had to remove excess details. Like, you know, we had some... <laughs> Ignore me, I goofed. <laughs> You're doing great. Don't worry. Uh, we had some mini games and things like that that we had to cut because players were just getting distracted from the important thing, which is learning about space, getting curious about space, and getting launch codes. Mm -hmm. And so we had to like cut away everything. And that's also one of the reasons why the game doesn't have like enemies that you fight or things that you collect, is because all of that extra stuff distracts people from exploring for the sake of knowledge. Oh, that's interesting. Were, were you ever? Did the team ever consider putting in collectibles or f combat or anything like that? Uh, no, that was very early a decision we made because um, uh, the goal was on the design side definitely to create a game where players were driven by curiosity alone. And so the best way to prove that hypothesis was by removing every other possible rewards, yeah. right? If you, if you have upgrades, if you have like collectibles, if you have any of that, players might be exploring for the sake of finding these. Mm. So we, from pretty early in the development process, uh, we uh, decided that the only reward you would ever get in the game is knowledge. Right. The only thing, there's no upgrades, there is no tools, new tools you get to unlock or whatever. The only thing you gain is knowledge. Mm. And sort of our yeah. face with the game. So, yeah, I think, and I'm, I'm so glad you brought up, uh, Wes, a minute ago, you were talking about having to tune everything so that people wouldn't spend too long or too little uh, time in a certain place. Um, this whole game feels finely tuned in a way that I kind of struggle to comprehend. Um, from the like the, the macro scale of the 22-minute loop to the way that um, different planets have different gravity scales and different movement speeds. And actually, like as you play this game and play the loop over and over, you'll start to realize that at certain points in time, certain things will happen. And you need to be there to see it or to you know do something about it. And all of that, I imagine, must have been like at least haphazardly planned and timed out, if not carefully tuned. So, like, what was that like? Can you tell me what your guiding principle was in trying to sort of nail down something like a twenty-two minute time loop, and how you, um, what challenges you faced in trying to get that just right? Um, play tests. Yeah, <laughs> lots and lots of play testing. Uh. We play tested like once every two, three weeks. Let's say three weeks to be safe, counting mm -hmm. vacation. So we play tested 
once every three weeks for, you know, three years. Basically, as soon as we started at Mobius, there were regular play tests, testing, you know, whatever we had just been working on, as well as, like, longer stretches of the game for new players. Mm. But, uh, oh, don't forget your spacesuit. Yep. Yeah. Is it not on by default? Is it not on by default? <laughs> I did this yesterday, yep. <laughs> I was like, I would never forget to put that on, and then I immediately died. <laughs> we are learning so much today. Uh, I guess that's that's let's the spring off though. Let's let the let's let the organicness of the moment um play into that. I can think of a lot of games that would look at that moment and go, Oh no, like we can't let the player do that. And instead you guys seem to have gone, Hell yeah, the player should be able to do that every time. They should be able to walk outside like the space on every run. They should be able to die right when they get into space. Um you, you already mentioned that that was a decision pretty early on to reward curiosity and learning and, and you know, the player should at some point get stop being a knucklehead and figure out they need to put on their spacesuit. But, um, uh, what other decisions did you need to make to, uh, complete that vision and make sure it wasn't just like a weird hob horse, I guess, that, that would, that would, that would only akin sometimes? I think for a lot of that fine tuning, it's just we as developers are kind of obsessive about it, mm -hmm. like sort of made sure that everyone who joined the team was just as detail oriented and believed in the vision of the game just as much. Um, so, you know, everyone from the creative director all the way down to just junior artists who were hired for a brief time, they were still on board with like, yeah, we're going to make sure that this piece of art or this bit of level design or this lighting and the way that it interacts with the area None of that is going to trick the player into doing the wrong thing. We're never going to fake anything. Uh, and so it was just really just a lot of hard work and dedication to that principle of we need to make sure that players are playing this for the right reasons. Right on. Mm -hmm. I guess I can give a quick shout out to Auditory, who said they finished this game a couple days ago and they love it so much. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Alex, I will throw the question all back to you now that I'm done dying in dumb ways. No, I'm not. Yeah, have you? No. Got, have you? <laughs> Incorrect. Incorrect. Ah, oh, man, I just like this game so much. I could just talk about any one of these planets for an hour. Um, I also have you guys played the Outer Worlds at all? <laughs> we did it. We did ask that too, for the record. If they played, yeah. Game. Uh, Was that <laughs> at the chance? It's yeah, been pretty, pretty PC. Yeah. And so is that? Uh, I'm just curious. Like, uh, it doesn't. Sometimes it can be hard to tell from the outside whether, uh, like, funny goofs like that when, you know, two notable games share a great name or a great launch window, uh, whether that actually, you know, gets on anyone's, like, um, mind or whether it, like, you know, affects business at all. Did, did coming out so close to that game and sharing such a close title, like, have any impact at all on your launch strategy or was it just kind of like a funny goof? I think we were definitely aware of it. Um, uh -huh. As, you know, we've, we've had the name Adderwilds for a very long time. And so... I think we saw when they registered the domain name, we're like, huh, hope that's just one of those that they don't actually use. Uh, and when they announced it, we're like, okay. Um, and so that was something we were aware of, but ultimately, like, the games are of such different, like, scales and such different target audiences yeah. that from our perspective, it was, like, probably just better for both games because the distinction and, like, the controversy around the naming um, you know, just got a lot of press for both of us. And so I think it ended up being just kind of like this funny thing that was good overall for exposure for both games. And we probably benefited more because we're a smaller studio and, you know, we're not already known. But nice. I think it was definitely helpful for both. Yeah, I hope so. We got a good question here in chat from Ludzu who wants to know, during those playtests, was there any specific things mentioned that helped you a lot? Or on the flip side, was there anything that came up during playtesting that you ignored? Uh, also, thank you so much for one of their favorite games ever. Uh, so yeah, uh, playtest, interesting feedback that shaped the course of the game or uh, pushback that you uh, chose ultimately not to go against because it sort of conflicted with the vision? Um, that, that's a good question. Uh, I think generally the, the main thing about playtests, uh, we're not like a, uh, like a number statistic. You know, we don't use playtests like in a statistic way of like, how many percent of players reaches A and does C and whatever? Uh, it is uh, more on a qualitative side of things. Uh, and as a result, I think all feedback is useful, though it's not to be necessarily interpreted 
literally. Mm. Like, you know, a player might find an area too difficult or might find a, a mechanic confusing, uh, but the way they'll express that might be, you know, might not be in such, uh, such a manner. So it's a lot of interpretation. So I don't know if there's anything we ignore, per se, as much as, like, you know, sometimes people complain about something and we're like, but actually the problem is here. Right. Making them feel, you know. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, tons of things. Um, when we, oh. One real quick example, just because you're here at the moment. Um, a lot of playtest changes were just simply, like, adding more lights to things. Uh -huh. um, like, players weren't finding escape pod. supposed to be one of the key entry points for each planet that has an escape pod. And so, like, yeah, just adding that big glowing border around the door, all of a sudden players see it and they go through it. And a lot of times it's just as simple as that, as, like, hey, this person played for two hours and they didn't find the thing that's supposed to be obvious. How can we make it more obvious without, like, beating people over the head? Mm. Uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, please. Uh, one of the playtests uh, uh, things that we that really impacted the game a lot and that uh, was a lot of fun for us was when players figured out solutions to puzzles that we hadn't thought of. Uh, there is, like, for example, a place in the game where you're supposed to time uh, things. Uh, 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 in a certain way to activate something. I can't spoil it too much. Uh, but then a player uh, tried to use their ship to sort of like protect them mm -hmm. from, uh, from what was affecting them. And we we're like, oh, this is a really clever idea. We should implement it so that that works. And so a lot of times players came up with really clever solutions and uh, we decided to make sure that these solutions would be like sometimes these solutions worked already but we're a bit janky so we're like okay how can we make it you know more uh, consistent so they don't feel like it's weird and you know um, so th that was really great the fact that there's now multiple solutions to a lot of the puzzles um, yeah uh, because we saw players do that try things and we implemented it oh i'm so glad to hear that because i think um you know, one of the striking parts of this game, I was telling Brian earlier this week, is that it sets up, because of the way it's, it allows for emergent gameplay, uh, it, you know, uh, all the systems interact and such, it sets up opportunities for, like, emergent stories to emerge that mirror, like, you know, gravity or contact or Apollo 13 or something, where you're just trying to figure out how to get your spaceship back in the air or something. Like, I had a, a situation uh, a night or two ago that was very similar, where I had to you know, there was a thing coming that I had to uh, avoid, and I basically, it was like a timed event, and I used the ship to survive it. Um, and I think that's like a really striking part of this game. Uh, was that, it's so crazy to me that that, that came out of the playtesting, because it, it seems so core and integral to the to the concept of the game. Um, but, you know, I'm impressed to hear that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, uh, here's a, I'm sorry, Brian, are you going to go back in that black hole again? Oh no! Something happening. Oh no! Virtual Hollow is actually a good example of a place where there's a lot of like weird ways to solve problems because mm. if you're really good at using orbital mechanics, you can use the black hole to slingshot yourself to all kinds of places that you're supposed to get to in you know less crazy ways. <laughs> so that's yeah, that fun testing in the game is like, hey, I wonder if I can get there with like a good a well timed slingshot and. We always enjoy seeing speedrunners figure out weird ways they can use the physics of the game to for given knowledge. Yeah, it's, it's really remarkable there aren't more like, and I imagine because it's so difficult, but there aren't more games about playing with gravity and slingshotting around in space. Um, yeah, gravity gift. Uh, yeah, there you go. A classic for sure. Um, so what I meant to get on there before I got distracted by Brian's fantastic uh, journey uh, is uh, we were talking this week also that this game has so many opportunities for storytelling and it also has this um it has a real uh, character and atmosphere to it um that is you know warm and convivial and like almost melancholy and you know very little of that comes out of the game design or out of the actual planets it comes so much out of the music and the bits of writing and the bits of art design and so i'm curious to know like can you speak to the process through which you try to enrich this um basically orrery with character and mood and atmosphere like how did you create those feelings and emotions in a game about space? 
it's a really good question. I think there's a lot of different factors that went into it. Um, I think from an art point of view, um, we knew pretty early on that that was sort of the tone we were going for, because it was already there even back in the alpha version of the game, um, is that sort of camping in space vibe. Um, where it's sort of like the end of summer and, you know, you're sitting by a campfire and it's that sort of wistful, like, this is all coming to an end, but it was a good run. Mm. Um, and, you know, feeling like you're you're in this friendly outdoor setting that's all about exploring and, you know, enjoying what you have while you have it. And I think that was that was there very early. And as we were revamping the art style, we tried all kinds of things, you know, making the alien stuff more alien or, you know, changing the scale of things to make it more epic or exciting. And really in the end, we kind of had to dial all that back because it ruined that feeling of camping in space. And so in the end it was like, all right, what kinds of things do you find at a camp? What kinds of things do you see in a national park? Uh, and we referenced a lot of like the old national park ad posters of yeah. like the sixties. Um, which is also when NASA was really big, so it's like fits really well with the NASA aesthetic. And so a lot of it was just making the decision to make the art less exciting visually in order to make it feel more comfortable and familiar, which sort of enhances the alien feeling in the end is because of that contrast. But it's sort of counterintuitive, and it took us a while to figure that out. Oh, yeah. I'm embarrassed to admit I didn't pick up on it earlier. There is a real... Like this is camp. The down to like the makeshift uniforms and the patched together stuff, and everyone's just kind of taking it easy. Yeah, Casey Yano here in chat with a shout out. Uh, they're a big fan of that 3D boosty HUD thing. That UI is great. Um, any was that tricky to, to design and implement to give people a sense of how they're flying through space? I imagine it must have been uh, hard. Oh yeah, yeah. We we tried a lot of different iterations for that, uh, and I'm glad that one works because that one was one of my little uh, additions to the game. Um, it used to be like a thing that spun more, uh, and I was like, what if it was just like a 3D, like every axis was represented and you could see in that direction, and we tested it out and we're like, oh yeah, people get it now when they're flying up or down. Um, so glad you noticed. Nice. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. I Something I've been wanting to get onto, and maybe this is a good time to, is sort of the, the business of how you get the word out about this. I mean, it, it seems like having the uh, uh, the buzz around the IGF and then now the GDCA uh, must have helped. But like, how did you get how did you get this game in front of people who you thought would like it? Like, did you was it a lot of marketing? Was it someone else's thing, or did you guys do a lot of social media and stuff? Like, how did you find the audience for this? Um, we were lucky enough that we had a really uh, committed group of fans from the Alpha. Mm. Uh, it was a it, it's it was a really amazing community to have uh, that was absurdly supportive. It, it, it was great to have them as sort of ambassadors for the game. Um, uh, so I think we we had that massive advantage from the start, uh, and then um, Annapurna, of course, uh, like the fact coming as an Annapurna as an Annapurna game, you know, uh, it immediately gives uh, a certain uh, respectability in mm -hmm. in the scene, and so I think a lot of people just not like these two audiences sort of like helped. Um, but yeah, no, the it's players from players, you know, uh, Mouse to Ear. Yeah, um, that that made it happen. I think it's also uh, you know, Anna Porna made a lot of really smart decisions, and I think one of the best things for us was being on Game Pass at launch because mm -hmm. new IP, you know, no one's heard about the game and it's the kind of game that you really have to dive into blind to experience it best. Uh, game Pass was really good for getting that initial wave of people who would advocate for us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those people are all spreading the word to others, which is wonderful. Um, but that initial, like, people giving it a shot, I think, was largely due to the Game Pass. Yeah. So that was I, I, Do you mean, think... I just had a okay. big oh wow moment. This is Bahalo. It's falling apart right in front of me. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's yep. now. It's good, right? <laughs> well, Every kidding. hour of this game is like that. You're like, oh, uh oh. <laughs> it's so good. Mm. It's like, I'm about to find a tree and refill my oxygen, even though the moon's, I have no fuel and the moon's going. The, something to crash into the sun. 
Yeah, man. Godspeed. Um, listen, so yeah, you talked about uh, Game Pass being big. Um, I'm curious, like, uh, do you think this game would have done as well uh, if it hadn't had access to a subscription service like uh, Game Pass? Like, if you just put it out um, just like as a straight up uh, pay to download title, do you think you would have done as well? It's hard. It's hard to say. Uh, I think that it, it's possible it would have done as well eventually, but Game Pass definitely sped up the reception a lot mm-hmm. um, in terms of just it, it's the game that has to spread by people talking about it, and Game Pass was a way to get a bunch of people talking about it really fast. So it could have yes. happened by a streamer, it could have happened by chance, um, but Game Pass was sort of a way to ensure that it would happen more quickly. Nice. Yeah, I ask because like uh at the office we talk about uh, in the industry we talk about like how subscription services and sort of game pass esque uh, offerings are going to change the way people play games and find games um and I, i'm always i'm always sort of on the edge between whether it's 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 a wonderful thing to have access to those services because people can discover things without a lot of uh barrier to entry they can just dip in and check it out and at the same time it feels like maybe it might in the long term to value like the value of a game if you can just get 200 for a monthly subscription i uh, how do you guys think about it as this happens right in front of us um i mean there is something to say about like in particular for a game like out of wilds that's very experimental mm. uh, and that's best played not knowing about it like game pass is just perfect you know and subscription subscription services are very useful uh I think uh, there's definitely an interesting, uh, I think it's going to push a certain amount of innovation and experimentation uh, because if you have access to that many games, maybe you don't want each of them to be just a slight twist on a previous game. Mm -hmm. Like you might be more interested in shorter experiences. You might be more interested in things that uh, you might not have tried before because you weren't sure you were going to enjoy them. So I think it's going to open very interesting avenues for games and uh, in particular uh, maybe also hopefully mean that we have less of a uh, monopoly on you know selling games on different platforms. Yeah, that'd be great. You um, you keep calling this an experimental game, and, and I, I totally agree. Like So much of what you've tried here in the systems and the way they interact is um, very experimental, and it's like a wonder in some ways that it all works so well as it does. Uh, but at the same time, it just feels strange to hear you talk about this game that way because it's, it's a game about exploring space, and that seems like a, a fundamental category of what uh, interactive entertainment could be. And yet when I think about space exploration games or games that remind me of this game, the one that comes to my mind is like Lunar Lander, which was decades ago. So, I mean, it's it's hard to argue with you. There aren't a lot of games like this. There aren't a lot of games that try this blend of of uh, exploration and, and that kind of thing. So, like, why do you think that is? And and beyond that, like, do you think you'll continue to try and make games like this going forward? I think a quick aside. It's also worth noting that when the project started in uh, 2013, that was before things like Elite Dangerous and No Man's Sky and Right. You know, all of these new space games, it's kind of been a resurgence that we're now like a part of. But mm. when the project was conceived, there were been like no space games for a long time. Yeah. 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 No, it was it, they, uh, and also like at the time, games were a lot more handholdy. Mm-hmm. Like uh, the, the project started when uh, Zelda Skyward Sword. Skyward Sword, yeah, just came out. <laughs> Uh, and so I, I think that, that that shows sort of like where the industry was at and where the sort of like the most games sort of like gravitated towards very handholdy, linear approach to things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really exciting. I mean, the latest Zelda being proof that uh, I think the while we worked on Out of Wilds, a lot of other people also gravitated towards more open exploration and more trusting the player and i think that that's a big thing that uh games such as dark souls have brought to uh to the scene it's this idea that as designers we can trust the players not to be you know not we don't have to tell them what to do at every step uh, every step of the way we can just present them with a fun environments and great mechanics 
and they'll experiment and try and they can figure it out on their own uh, with great UI and a lot of playtest to make sure it is understandable, but <laughs> it is doable. Um, man, uh, I was talking to um, Hugo, Mar uh, Hugo Martin of id Software kind of about the same thing. Um, uh, he was talking about how, about, you know, uh, again, fighting that instinct to just make everything easy. And he, he, he outright said, you know, there was a trend where games couldn't be hard, was his, was his words. Um, uh, man, this, this place is weird. This place is weird. I'm uncomfortable. I'm going away. You should go in there. Please go in there. No. Please, please go in Dark fine. Ramble, please. <laughs> fine. Fine. It's the, the, do it for the stream. This is fine. <laughs> All right. Let me uh, push it. Um, anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is interesting, just because I've, I've heard AAA devs talking about the same thing in a different way, and it's interesting that, like, the Dark Souls lesson was kind of that. Alright. I'm in. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The Dark Souls lesson was... <laughs> good, Alex, but it was. Alex, take over. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah man, good luck in there. Something fucky. Um... Yeah, I think uh, it is certainly interesting to see this, uh, to see what, what feels like a renewed and reinvigorated wave of teams, you know, studios and developers uh, trusting players and not sort of hand holding them through uh, the game. Uh, I, I wonder, I wonder if we'll ever go back around the other way. You know, like will there be a backlash where suddenly there's a huge emphasis on intuitive tutorial design or streamlined tutorial design or what have you? Uh, oh, wow, Brian, you nailed it. Good work. Um, uh yeah so but uh for now what i kind of wanted to get at was uh do you do you feel rewarded by pursuing this uh like uh philosophy of game design and like will you are you excited to continue doing it like do you are you still interested in making games that are about exploration and not holding the player's hand about discovery or um are you excited to work on something that is maybe a little less experimental i think it's uh it's a little bit of both um mm -hmm. We're all kind of. Outer Wilds was a very difficult game to make. Um, we often joke that it's exactly the type of game you should not make. Like, our advice to people is don't make Outer Wilds. It's really just not a good idea. How come? It's just. There's a lot of tools in game development that are built around assumptions, mm -hmm. um, like the assumption that you're going to make things flat, because that's what you do. You're, you're going to have a flat plane and you're going to build everything on that flat plane. And when you're building these spherical planetoids, there just aren't tools to do that. And so you have right. to do them yourself. Um, and it's a lot of little things like that, like game engines are built around static objects that don't move. And anything that it, like interacts with physics is marked as not static because it's different and needs to behave differently. Everything in Outer Wilds is not static. So we couldn't rely on a lot of things that static objects can do and optimizations that apply to static objects because nothing is static. Right. Um, lighting? Lighting, yeah. We, you know, lighting is all based on like either lights are everywhere or lights are localized, but we wanted lights to be spherical. And that's, you know, not really how they're built. Um, mm -hmm. And so a lot of the game was just like, okay, we need to do this thing that every game does because that's what you do in games, but we can't do it because the game engine or the 3D modeling software just doesn't support spheres or movement on like a fundamental level. Yeah. And so that's like at least from an asset creation, from an art side of view, that was like the biggest diff hurdle that we had to overcome is that just the tools are not there and we had to make a lot of our own tools to do it. Right. Did you, this is a silly question, I guess, but did you make those tools available to anybody else? They sound useful or is it all internal? It's all internal. So mm. far. We, we've talked about maybe trying to package them uh, to make them accessible to more people. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, like any internal tools, there's a lot of shortcuts that you use. And we're like, that would be a lot of work. So we, we haven't done there. But if a lot of people ask, uh, honestly, like that, that is something we would, uh, we would happily uh, try to take the time to do. I would love to see more spheres in video games. Spheres are the best. It's Brian, get in there. Don't don't be don't don't be chicken. Get in there. Get in there. I'm trying to get to the thing just, or, orbiting it. Well, I mean, just just fly inside the planet. It's good. <laughs> stop, it's a good look. Stop telling me what to do. You know my. I'm I'm backseat flying. Come on, let's go. Um. Yeah. Well. I call okay. Content so. Here. <laughs> 
Uh, well, then I, I, I hope you, uh, I hope you find something that's a little less strenuous to work on for your next project. I just uh, love this little navigator thing down in the lower left-hand corner for this ship. The oh, you know what's great? Are firing. I'm, yeah, that, that whole UI is great. We should talk about that. But also, unbuckle and look down to your bottom right to find the eject button. Because you're going to want that eject button at some point. Is there an eject button? No, it's, it's on the console. Look down on the console. There's like a little thing you flip up. No, it's to the left. <laughs> this is good. This is good content. Anyway, there's an there's no. an eject button on the console. Tell me about that eject button. Who put that in there and why? Um, I'll take partial credit for that. Please. I, I spent a lot of time working on the ship, um, and one of the big goals for the ship was to make it feel like it's it's sort of twofold. It's both the player's home. You want the player to feel like it's a safe space and that they can, you know like have a lot of useful things there so it's not just jump out of it and be on your way um, but we also wanted the ship to interact with all the systems in the game mm -hmm. and so at some point we were like hey we should make it so the ship can like break apart so if you slam you know one of the sides of the ship it can actually get pulled off and you know your ship can damage and you end up with those cool apollo 13 moments where it's like you're spiraling out of control and right. so we took a lot of effort to like go back and make the ship modular so that we could break it apart and you know have it actually systems can break individually and all of that. Uh, and while we were doing that, we were like, "Hey, we've just made it so the cockpit can just like pop off the front of the ship. Why don't we just put a button in that does that just for fun?" And uh, mm -hmm. pressing it too much, so we kind of had to hide it a little bit so it wasn't obvious. <laughs> but mm. sorry, I'm not <laughs> obsessed with this object. See what I was. See, this whole planet's so good. Ugh. Um, yeah, uh, and also like, uh, I love the eject button. I'm so glad you put it in. Um, these little, these little light up indicators on the HUD. These like um, very analog uh, thrust indicators. Were those also yours, or was that were those the result of playtesting? Or because I can't remember if those were in the original build or not. No, the original, the the Alpha ship um, was pretty bare bones. Yeah. I think a lot of us on the team are a big fan of um, diegetic UI stuff that's like built into the game itself and not just on the screen. Um, so that's why like a lot of the HUD elements only appear when you put on your helmet, just because it's actually like a thing in world that's being projected. Um, we make an exception for button prompts just because people need to learn how to play the game, and nope. that makes sense for that to be in world. But yeah, we 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 took the we went the extra mile to make all of the ship and all the player tools communicate information physically instead of just something popping up on screen because it makes you feel like an astronaut. You feel yeah. like interacting with these instruments and you feel like you're a part of the world and you know that's the same reason why we put your body in the game so when you look down you see your feet is to make you feel like you're there which heightens the sense of space. Mm. Did you learn anything fun about physics or space exploration while you were making this video game? Oh god. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Seems like a fun project to work on if you're really into NASA. Oh yeah, our our technical artist Logan um, programmed all the shaders, and so things like the atmospheres around planets. That's a shader that Logan wrote, mm. and a lot of research went into like how do atmospheres work actually? Yeah. Because in order to get it to look right, it has to pretty much just receive light in the same way, and so. A lot of times during the project, we would take a dive into something like that. It's just like, all right, for the black hole in Brittle Hollow, like that's just actual black hole math. Yeah, that's what that's so exciting to me. Like, I, maybe it's childish, but there just aren't a lot of uh, opportunities to put your face inside a universe and see what a black hole does. Uh, and this is one of them. Uh, and I'm so glad to hear you guys put some work and research into actually making that look uh, what it might actually look like. Balls. Good luck. <laughs> Uh, um, boy, what was I about to ask? Uh, Brian, you distracted me with this beautiful planet. Uh, shucks. Well, anyway, we're coming to the end of our hour. We've got about 15 minutes left. Folks in chat, if you have any questions uh, about this game or about its development or about what their devs are going to be up to now, please put them in chat, and we would be very happy to relay them. Uh, Brian, you're doing great. Do you have any uh, pressing questions? No. <laughs> you just uh, this is right, one of those games where like all my questions get thrown out by the concentration it takes to play. Where did that island even go? I'm really not sure. It's just something. Down. We're on giant's deep. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm well, this tornado. Bro, that's, this is what's happening. You're killing it. You're doing great. <laughs> what could go wrong? Uh, how are you guys feeling about all these, uh, all the awards and coverage and stuff? Do you feel like that was uh, worth we, the we time? We should probably awards they're nominated for, man. Right. Well, Here. see, I was. I left him talk- in black. Can you grab that? Uh, yeah, I would be. I would be happy to. So, after uh, winning the IGF a few years ago. Uh, and now I believe you're up for Game of the Year at uh, Game Developers Choice Awards, the Best Debut, Best Divine, uh, Best Design, Innovation, and the Narrative Award. That's that's a good uh, slew of honors. Uh, how are you feeling about all this awards coverage and what it has done for the game? Has it been just unalloyed good? Has it been worth the effort of investing in that kind of uh, coverage, or has it been in any way interesting? I mean, it's always really uh, awesome to be uh, considered uh, for that uh, sort of awards, and uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been the reception, both critically and player-wise, has been wonderful. Uh, personally, like I mean, it's it's a huge honor to receive awards. Mm-hmm. I think some of the fan letters we've been receiving have been just heartbreakingly wonderful yeah <laughs> uh, nice. and uh that, that 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 would be personally my the greatest reward is like hearing about like uh you know parents playing with their kids and their kids wanting to learn about science or become an astronaut and that sort of thing has been incredible and, uh, yeah no, it's, it's that's fantastic i'm so glad to hear it uh what is it do you have any strong concerns at this point about supporting this game? I mean, you're talking about porting it, and it sounds like it's still a lot of work uh, as you continue to work on it. But like, in terms of support, is it just patching and bug fixing now, or do you have anything else you want to do with uh, Outer Wilds as a uh, piece of media? We've we've actually made some significant changes post launch. Mm. Maybe maybe more changes than we should have. Uh, oh, how but, come? Tell me about it. Uh, we've we've tweaked level design in several areas to try and like help players uh, figure out some of the in-game solutions to things because Mm. we just didn't have enough play test data and once everyone's playing it, you get more data. Uh, Added some like fun little features like the ability to doze off at campfires to pass time a little bit more quickly, which is that we always wanted to do but we didn't have time to release. Um, So just, we're we're still fiddling with it a bit. Um, It's definitely, uh, it's hard to put down. Nice. Um, th- I know this is not necessarily the first game for all of you. I'm sure uh, you have a variety of experience under your belt, but this being having its origins as a student project and now hitting this so much far later, it feels like there must be um, some like well-deserved uh, like honor and like uh, like pride, but also like is there any is it are you stressed at all about making your next game after this? It seems to have done very well. It's certainly being well received by folks like us. Uh, and now you guys are going to have to move on to something else. Is there any like weight about a sophomore slump or any concern about what you're going to do next, or is it just all good vibes and optimism? It's definitely uh, <laughs> a bit scary moving forward, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a hard thing to follow up. So mm. I think we're all... It's a little bit of both, right? Because the, the positive response to the game means that... We, we found an audience that wants this type of thing, which is the type of thing that we want to make, generally speaking. Yeah. So that's super exciting to see that there is an audience for a weird game like Outer Wilds. But it's also like Outer Wilds was a seven-year project, and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into making it. And it's very daunting to think of going through that process again and taking yeah. a big risk. Yeah. Like that. I can only imagine. Uh, well, we are. Uh, oh, actually, Brian, uh, you were looking at that writing a minute ago. Yeah. We should talk about this writing. It's great. Uh, I about, and it's like the whole conception of an alien thing in this because everything in here is really smart. Uh, like a, yeah. a smart way to think about alien life. Right. So, like, let's start with with the writing and go from there. Like, what? Can you guys speak to what uh, influenced the design process for this kind of like totally, uh, to me at least, being very uh, uneducated and American, uh, like relatively novel way of writing and flowing sort of curly Q scripts? Like, wh- where did that come from, if you know? Um, so, 
Uh, we uh, we worked very closely with our writer, uh, Kelsey Dixon. We did all the writing in the game. Mm. Uh, and um, one of the, sort of like one of the prompts we had uh, was uh, the idea of making text something you would explore the same way you explore everything else in the game. Huh. Uh, so we wanted to make it spatial. We wanted to make it explorable. And uh, Kelsey had the idea of sort of like using her own way of sort of like taking notes uh, and sort of like, uh, so this branching kind of like forum style. Uh, oh, kind interesting. Of way of, instead of like this linear writing, it's more of a like, you know, it's a branching forum uh, of conversations. Mm. And that was, yeah, the, I, I think she, she was mentioning it was uh, kind of uh, influenced by her own way of taking notes. And so we took that and then we played uh, with the visuals. Um, and I think we, we looked at a, a lot of different uh, influences and we ended up uh, picking spirals um, as the best way to do that. Uh, but yeah, no, they, uh, Kelsey has done an amazing job uh, creating the writing and building like uh, so much, so much characters into these stories, right? Because none of the writing is just backstory. All of the writing is usable, useful information that you can actively use in game. Mm. That's really important for us to do that, and we learned that as we developed the game. But like, there's such a uh, players are so used to see writing as lore as, you know, bonus thing that you just read if you want to when you have the time. Right. Um, and so, like, we had to sort of teach that to players and, you know, make sure they understood that, like, no, everything you read has actual, like, you can use it. It actually talks about something in the world, and you can uh, use that. Uh, but as a result, it, you know, we could have made the writing very dry, and so we were really happy because he was able to put in so much like character and humor and uh, drama and romance into that writing that is about, you know, telling you dry facts about the world. Uh, yeah. No, absolutely. I, I, I think Brian can attest. I can, I can sometimes be a harsh critic of writing in video games. And I think like the writing in this game is, is really uh, affecting for how sparse it is. You know, it is, it is so much just like info on the walls, environmental storytelling, yet nevertheless, the, whoever, you know, the writer was able to like really bring a sense of character and like pathos to these uh, wall scribbles. So like, I think that's great. You guys make the, you, and I don't understand why no other game developer has, has uh, not aimed for this goal, is you guys take the ancient civilization trope and manage to, uh, flip it on its head, and instead of all the writing either feeling like it's coming from scientists or, I don't know, at best, scientists, if it feels like, if ancient writing feels like it's come from inside a world, it'll be scientists or something, or people who would be leading logs, um, or it's, it's, it presents as unintelligible, unintelligible gibberish re reinterpreted by the character that you're piloting, um, it's, uh, here, it's people, it just feels like people, it feels like notes that could have been left five minutes ago. Um, and the translation mechanic doesn't get in the way of that. And I like that a lot. It makes me want to learn more about these people instead of, I have to say it, uh, two of my favorite game series, AAA game series, both that both relied on ancient alien metaphors, got more and less and less interesting the more I learned about them because everything felt very sterile and, and less, less, less suitable. Um, I will start wrapping things up today. Uh, I'm, I'm a little tired. My ship is gone. Error. Um, You're doing great. Yeah. Thank you all for watching the GDC Twitch channel. We would appreciate it if you click the follow button to get notifications about when we go live with some great game developers. Uh, if you check our archives, uh, we just wrapped up a stream earlier today with the folks from Control at Remedy. Um, and you can watch uh, the Game Developers Choice Awards uh, on March 8th, starting uh, in the evening. That evening, because I don't have the exact time. And I'm not going I don't, to. I don't think it's March 8th. You want to support March 18th, that? 18th, 18th. Yeah. Yeah. It's more cheesy. I'm tired. Um, we're we're, we're worse. Tired. <laughs> this country is tired. Um, yeah, so if you want to attend in person, if you have a GDC pass, everyone can attend. If you want to watch online from the comfort of your home, 
Uh, you can yeah. do too. Just stay tuned to this Twitch channel. Um, and oh, that's why you hit the follow button. Um, other than that, uh, that's all I've got for today. Thank you to Bone and Wesley for joining us. And uh, if they have more questions about the making of this game, where should they ask them? Support, support at Mobius Digital Games. Right on. Nice. I'm still waiting for a developer to just go, don't. <laughs> we have a small team, so we do see your emails. Yeah. Uh, and we also, we don't participate a lot in it, um, but we, we check the uh, subreddit as well, at our subreddit. Cool. Very cool. Anyway, with that, I will let you all go, and uh, have a nice day, everyone. Bye. Okay. Bye. This game's great.